Yes, somebody just say fire. <laughs> say freedom. freedom. Breakthrough. Breakthrough. No, limits. no limits. Amen. Thank you. You can be seated. Anybody else just love Gabe Valenzuela? Anybody appreciate his message a few Sunday mornings ago? And yeah. Gabe, I just don't think you're running at enough Goliath, so <laughs> I, I, just, I was just thinking about that. <laughs> I think I might have a, need a meeting with you. To <laughs> no, thanks for your leadership, and thanks for the Sunday night team. Wow, what a, what a great team we have here, and, and just uh, there's a revival spirit in the air. I love what, what Bill Johnson said. Anybody else like what some things Bill said? <laughs> I mean, one of them said, one of my favorite quotes of Bill is, instead of praying for a revival, why don't you just have one? (laughs) He also said, said, the only closed heavens are between your ears. Well, we got some powerful, we got some visitors here as well, some friends from people connected with us, and what a a great thing. I've got a a wonderful team of staff and third years. Why don't you guys just stand up just right now, and yeah, just, uh, yeah, there's, we're going to activate a few of them here in a moment, and then, um, do we have any Bethel Leaders? I work in the Bethel Leaders Network Department with Dave and Taff Harvey. Any of you here staff or third years, stand up if you're a part of that as well. Yeah. We, we just love what God's doing in the Bethel Leaders Network. And it's, a, it's the part of Bethel. Hey, I think we got a slide of that, a couple slides. Slide people. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> We're gonna, <laughs> and, and, and if you're interested, if you're a leader and you want to just be equipped and connected with this culture, and you're from outside uh, Reading area, uh, there's I think there's another slide with a QR code as well. Why don't you just leave that up just for a few minutes? And it's really exciting what the Lord's doing and networking like-hearted leaders together in such a way. Some of the I get to travel. I was in um, Caldwell, Idaho last weekend at a place called Valley Church. And the Lord, how I many of you know the, the Lord, he's doing it around the world. It's amazing in traveling, watching the water level has been rising. It, it, it's uh, just, there's a fresh move of the Holy Spirit that's happening right now. There's a fresh move of the Holy Spirit with young people, with teenagers, uh, I, I'm seeing that, and I see a youth revival. <clears throat> There's a youth revival exploding right now, and it's, uh, it's going to increase. Hey, I've got three team members. We're going to do some quick uh, testimonies before I get into the message. Come, come on up. Those of you, i got uh, Rob, Will, and Angela. Yes. How many, anybody, <laughs> you're like testimonies. Yep, the testimony of Jesus is a spirit of prophecy, and we have some, we have some good ones. Yes, we got the microphone here. Angela is uh, she works for Igniting Hope and Bethel Leaders Network. She did BSSM. Rob is from uh, South Africa by way of Hong Kong, and now here. And Will is from Canada. Yes. Yes. Why don't you start us off with Angela with a testimony. What do you got? Who's ready for testimony time? A few months ago, I was in Pendleton, Oregon at a women's retreat, and we did a fire tunnel. And this woman was 77 years old, walked through the fire tunnel and encountered the power of God for the very first time. I watched as this woman safely fell under the power of God. <laughs> When she came out of the fire tunnel, she went off to the side, sat in her chair. I went over and I said, what was that like? And she just kind of baffled her head and she says, everything finally makes sense. 
So right now, yeah, do it. right now, if you are over the mature age of 70 years old, would you just stand? Come on. Over 70. Yes. Yeah. Woo! Right now, would you just extend your hands to these people? Right now, Lord, I just pray that you would encounter encounter these children of yours with the power of the Holy Spirit. Would they be able to feel you? Would they be able to know you in deeper levels? Would you reignite their dreams? Would you reignite the fire that lives inside of them? We need you. The Lord is saying, we need you. He's not done with you, and we can't wait to partner with you. Amen. Amen. Wow. Well, God wants you to abound. My mom was on a Zoom call um, a couple of years ago, digital missions. She joined a Zoom call. Um, She was getting prayed for. Um, She needed a knee replacement and and couldn't have one for some other reasons. And uh, they just prayed for her. And she just kind of stood up and she says, the pain's gone. The pain's gone. And, and all of a sudden, she, went, she works and she's got stairs at her office and she couldn't climb any stairs. And she went to work a couple of days later and she was just bounding up the stairs. So if, if you have or need a knee replacement or you have knee pain, God wants to release the knee pain from you today. And if you have that, you want to just quickly stand. Just activate your faith. Yeah. Just stand. Let's do that. Amen, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, we just thank you that thank knee you, pa- Lord. Yeah, th- that knee pain is something yes. that was taken care of on the cross. The cross was enough, Lord. So we thank you that knee pain is in submission to the blood of Jesus, and we speak to every knee in this place, healing in Jesus' name. Yeah. Amen. Someone needed that miracle tonight. <laughs> Wait a minute while the joy of the Lord settles over the room. (laughs) Here's a testimony I've been sorting through from Igniting Hope. A lady was listening to our podcast. There was a specific revelation that hit her spirit with such force. She said, I felt two demonic spirits leave me. I didn't even know that was possible, she says. And as soon as those spirits left her, she felt joy filling her. She burst into laughter. And as she felt the joy and the presence of the spirit wash through her body, all of her pain and her chronic fatigue syndrome completely left her. Yeah. Yeah. And what I want to do is just add faith tonight. God is upgrading faith, not just for a miracle right now, but as Steve preaches, as verses are being released, as revelations are loosed, God is raising your expectation for what can happen through the power of the preached word. Today, now is the time of salvation. In two weeks' time, at the end of this month, my mother is going to be celebrating 21 years clean and sober. So right now, God is releasing... God is releasing freedom in the room. He's celebrating the progress and the things that you guys have let go of, but the things that are still, you feel like you can't get set free from. Deliverance is happening right now in the name of Jesus. Did you say 21 years? 21 years. 21 years from now, someone's gonna testify that it started in this meeting. Yeah, he's the God of hope. I was uh, on a missions trip. We were, we were ministering in Jacksonville. I was walking with a man who had lost his wife um, and was just sort of very hopeless and down. And you could see it written all over him. And the Holy Spirit just gently whispered, um, Rob, there's joy available. I put my arm around him and I just said, Brian, there's joy available. And just the joy of the Lord just hit him. He began r- laughing and laughing. We're in, we're in beach ministry in Jacksonville. He just laughed all the way to the car. He laughed all the way back to the meeting. He laughed through the meeting. His son was radically touched with joy and the whole meeting just broke out in joy. So I, I actually have a scripture quickly that I just wanted to share that I really felt the Lord on. And uh, Psalm 126 verse five, those who sow in tears shall harvest with joyful shouting. And I really just believe yeah. that's for anyone who is struggling with hope right now with a circumstance or something that you are dealing with, that He is here for you right now. He is the God of hope. Rob, is joy available? 
Joy is available. <laughs> uh, sorry, Rob, I didn't hear that. Joy is available. In buckets. <laughs> buckets. Ooh. Some prophetic words, they feel like an insult. Here's one that I received. God is going to take your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. Ouch, are you saying I have a hard heart? This was a woman who prophesied this over me. Um, I was a bit frustrated, a bit... Uh, I didn't like that word. <laughs> who wants to hear they have a hard heart? But I did. Years ago from being a child, I locked down my emotions, years without crying, and through a series of encounters, God broke open my heart. It's not a day that goes by without tears. I'm crying right now as I worship, as I pray, as I encounter God's presence just in Scripture alone. And there's people tonight that God is actually activating your emotions again. He's giving you a heart of flesh. He's taking your heart of stone. You know right now as I'm speaking that you've actually not been feeling, that you've been locked down, that you've not been tender towards the Lord. But tonight, God is restoring the joy of your salvation. God is giving you a new heart, a heart of flesh. Yeah. Just say, I receive it. I'll never be the same again. Amen. Give it up for the team here. Thanks, guys. Wow. My message tonight is, is entitled, Will You Just Decide? Will You Just Decide? And, and before I, I get into it, I, I just want to just uh, give a quick bio on me. Uh, I met J Bill Johnson in 1991, pastoring a, a rural church in central Nevada near Las Vegas, and made the brilliant decision, and we're talking about decisions tonight. And by the way, decision-making isn't just uh, trying to stop negatives. The greatest decisions actually launch us into our, our prophetic destiny. I made a decision to invite Bill Johnson to my church of 30 people in 1991. <laughs> now, I, wa I wasn't a a anointed enough at that time, smart enough to make that, that good of a decision. And, and the Lord's going to make, have caused you to make decisions in this coming season that are way beyond what you think you're capable of. And you're going to look back and you're going to say, how did I do that? It's because God loves you so much because he believes in you. He believes you more than you believe in yourself. And so, and then I pastored by, with my wife, Wendy. She was going to be here tonight, but she could not be here. But holy, her spirit's here. She's, uh, we're one. And uh, we pastored in Weaverville from 2001 to 2008, where Bill Johnson had pastored 17 years. And I had the privilege of Gabe Valenzuela as my youth pastor, associate pastor. And we, we had a great time, and he did such a powerful job. And uh, and then came here in 2008, and basically, I, I, I travel a lot. I love the body of Christ. I love the church. I love church leaders. I used to be able to uh, criticize senior leaders until I became one. Ha <laughs> <laughs> ha. Yep, the old Monday morning quarterback Steve <laughs> criticizing senior leaders. And um, I love the church. By the way, I just release an impartation over you to love the church. And just release a, a, a healing for any brokenness or hurt that you've experienced from the church. And, and, and that God will heal that. And just that you'll be able to trust again. And thank you for that. And, and we, my wife and I, we have a ministry called Igniting Hope Ministries. And we have an assignment to ignite hope. Uh, there, there's no hopeless circumstances. There's just people who do not have hope. There's no hopeless circumstances. There's just people who do not have hope. And once people get true hope, circumstances can't stay the same. Hope is the belief that the future will be better than the present. And I and we have the power to help make it so. Hope is the belief that the future will be better than the present and that I and we have the power to help make it so. 
Hope is what energizes us. Hope is why Martin Luther King Jr. said, I have a dream. I got a dream. He had hope that things would get better. And we got a long way to go, but he made a difference. He made a huge difference. And, you know, just hope, our, our hope level is the indicator of whether we're believing lies or truth. Increasing hope in our lives is the evidence we're renewing our mind with truth instead of lies. Decreasing hope in our lives is the evidence we're renewing our mind with lies instead of truth. And our hope level determines our influence level. He who has the most hope is the most influence. And even tonight, I mean, how many, this has been a good meeting tonight. Man, oh man, this has been a good meeting. Even tonight, there, there's an impartation of hope that's being released. And we've written a number of books. And matter of fact, uh, after the service tonight, and I'm going to be talking about this book, my most recent book, Fully Convinced, The Art of Decision Making. And I'm actually doing a book signing after the service in the entryway by Hebrews. And this book is probably, in my opinion, the most important book I've ever written. And I've written a number of books, Victorious Mindsets, You're Crazy If You Don't Talk to Yourself. Ha ha. Ha Declarations, why do we do offering declarations? I wrote a whole book on that, the biblical reason for that. Wrote a book with Tracy Rice here called Declare It recently. Just it's powerful, igniting hope in 40 days, igniting faith in 40 days, uh, possessing joy. Let's just laugh at that. And it's a, it, it just, there's this joy and hope and all tie into being fully convinced. Now, I really, anybody else appreciate Chris's message this morning? Yeah. Some things. He said, faith is a fight. The righteous shall live by faith. He heard you've been, you've been too domesticated. Do the deeds you did at first. You thought I was building a business, but I am building a man. (laughs) Someone say amen to that. Yeah, I think think we're building a ministry. No, actually, I'm building you, Steve. What if the reason you are where you are right now is because of your faith? (laughs) Mm -hmm. Faith is released in speech. We are coming into a season of incredible prosperity. Reading is going to be like a capital city. Whatever you got delivered from, you have power over. And when we think about beliefs, because what we believe is ultimately more important than what we do. What we do is important, but it's not as important as what we believe. That the kingdom is not moved forward by good behavior. It's moved forward by good beliefs. The old covenant was moved forward by good behavior. It was was about the law. The new covenant is moved forward by good beliefs. We're called believers. It should tip us off on what we're supposed to be doing. (laughs) That kind of makes sense. (laughs) Now, the question of the hour, even though we're going to be talking about decision-making, the greatest decisions we make is what to believe. And one of the greatest revelations that we can get is that we can choose what we're going to believe. I get to choose what I'm going to believe about me, who I believe I am, what I believe I can do. I get to choose what I believe about you. I get to choose what I believe about my future. 
So the, the, the question of the hour is not, Lord, what should, I, what should I do? The greater question is, Lord, what should I believe? What do you want me to remo- renew my mind with in 2023? And I used to only renew my minds with, with my minds. <laughs> yeah. I used to only renew my mind with my feelings and past experience. That's all I, used to re- that's all I came into agreement with. And the Lord says, bummer for you, Steve. Bummer, because you're going to do a lot of laps in the wilderness. Because until you start renewing your mind with something higher than what you're feeling and experiencing, you're just going to repeat what you've always experienced. And so we have beliefs in five areas of life, and we're going to talk about one of them tonight, beliefs about decisions. We have beliefs about God. We have beliefs about ourselves. We have beliefs about people in our life, and we have beliefs about circumstances, and we have beliefs about the decisions we've made and have made. Now, this, is, this message is called, will you, just, will you Just Decide? It really could be called, uh, Buddy, Will You Just Decide? <laughs> I've got a, a, if you can put the slide up that has our, my dog buddy on it that talks about our ministry, <clears throat> that would be Wonderful. Now, by the way, my wife is wonderful. I'm going to pause for a moment. We have a dog. His name is Buddy. And uh, he is a schnoodle mixture between giant schnauzer, standard poodle. And Buddy um, has many good qualities. <laughs> Has, but he has a couple issues. <laughs> and one of the issues is, is that if Buddy uh, is outside, we have a slider, glass slider door that comes into our kitchen, and, and, and Buddy will indicate that he wants in, either by barking or just standing there staring at us. <laughs> and so what we'll do as being good masters We'll move to the door, and we'll open the door for Buddy. But here's the common thing. It probably happens about 75% of the time. He'll just stand there looking in the house. (laughs) And I can just imagine what's going on in Buddy's thinking. You know, the door is opened, but now I'm in doubt whether I should actually go in. (laughs) You know, because if I go in, I might miss something out here. Uh Uh-huh. But if I stay out here, I may miss something like food in there. (laughs) And I'm thinking, and sometimes I'll just say it, buddy! Will you just decide? I mean, hey, if you come in, just attach faith to it that you're supposed to be in and believe you're supposed to be in and just be in by faith. If you want to stay out, I bless you. You're powerful. You're powerful. You just stay out, believe you're supposed to be out there, and have a good time out there. (laughs) How many of you know the Lord speaks to us through things like that? We think it's just all about Buddy. It's actually all about me. I remember we had a cat named Dewey a few years ago, and... And um, we had a cat door for Dewey. But Dewey couldn't seem to figure out the cat door. (laughs) And I started um, speaking out negativity concerning Dewey. Yeah, I know, it's shocking. (laughs) 
I'd say things like, Dewey's never going to get it. Dewey's just a dumb cat. <laughs> and I mean, these things, I, I know life and death is in the power of the tongue, but sometimes I forget. Sometimes I compartmentalize that truth. Mm-hmm. Ha-ha. <laughs> compartmentalize it just to areas that I think are more spiritual. The Lord says, Steve, that's dumb to say. I want you to start declaring life over Dewey. And amazing. I just started saying, he's, man, he's a smart cat having a non-smart cat experience. <laughs> he's going to get it. He's going to get it. He's going to, and it's amazing. The next day, he figured it out. Lord saying, hello. <laughs> so, Steve, will you just decide? Man, will you decide whether you really actually believe you're righteous or not? Just decide. Just decide. Will you decide whether you believe you're powerful or not? Will, will you um, decide how you're going to think about that difficult relational situation? Will you just decide? Will you, you know, one day you're this, another day you're that. And, you know, when we, we talk about decision-making, and I want to just give you just a few um, quotes that are important to me in, in decision-making. Uh, one, is a bad decision made in faith has a greater likelihood of success than a good decision made in doubt? Let me see that one again. A bad decision made in faith has a greater likelihood of success than a good decision made in doubt. I'm not saying sin in faith. Go rob a bank in faith. But... So many decisions that we make don't have a clear God command in Scripture. We don't hear an audible voice. We do the best job we know how to do in, in, in determining what the Lord wants, and, and, and then we need to decide and attach faith to it. Cheerfulness is a main evidence we've attached faith to what we are doing. Cheerfulness is a main evidence that we've attached faith to what we're doing. How we make decisions is more important than the decisions we make. Now, we may stumble into some good decisions, but those who've got a good process of decision-making will make, will make higher-level decisions, will make catalytic decisions. The anxiety of not knowing what to do is a bigger problem than not knowing what to do. The anxiety of not knowing what to do is a bigger problem than not knowing what to do. What the Lord's going to have us do, he's going to have us go to the root of that anxiety first. And sometimes, you know, I, I'm saying, Lord, I want an answer. <laughs> and he says, Steve, you know, because when we get into decision-making mode, the, I've noticed this, the Lord often doesn't, doesn't seem to be clarity because he wants to deal with me. Because I'm, 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 I'm perking my ear at a higher level. What are you saying, Lord? But then he's, he goes after some roots in me. Fear, anxiety, double-mindedness, doubt. And then... Many people's tiredness is because they have not attached faith to what they are doing. And are doing what they are doing in doubt or out of duty. I think I'll read that one again. Mm -hmm. Many people's tiredness is because they have not attached faith to what they are doing and, or they're doing it in, because they're doing it in doubt 
or out of duty. Now, I want to just give you some, just a few foundational things on decision making, and then we're going to, I want to give you one truth tonight that I believe is going to change your life. You ready for it? The, the average adult makes 35,000 decisions every day. <laughs> and most of them are not consequential. You know, when I wake up in the morning, I choose what coffee cup to choose. And, and, and many of them are like that, but some, some are obviously more serious. Uh, where are we going to live, major financial pur- purchases, uh, et cetera. Um, there's two extremes in the kind of people who make decisions. One, uh, I, w- I would call the feeling-based, impulsive decision maker. And these are passionate and wholehearted, but often do not consider the consequences of their decisions. And, and there's, there's some of time, this is really good. How many of you know Peter, uh, he didn't think, he said, if it's you, Lord, tell me to come when he walked on water. I mean, Peter was impulsive, and, and, and some of us need to get a little bit more bold, step out of the boat. Chris talked a lot about that today. But, I'll, but how, many, how many have ever made a feeling-based decision and kind of regretted it? Mm-hmm. That's one extreme. The other extreme is what I would call the perfectionistic or religious-minded decision-maker. <laughs> the religious mindset decision maker. And, and this would probably be most or uh, more would fall into this category uh, th- of being a sincere believer who's regularly double-minded and in doubt about what we're doing. Wendy, my wife, has had to struggle with me in decision making for a long time. I'm getting better. But I've struggled because I've I've wanted to just please the Lord so much. It has to be perfect, this decision. And I might be wrong. And and so I'm just in this place of, uh, of deciding but still having a little bit of doubt, like a dripping faucet in the back of my spirit this may not be right. You may be wrong. And, you know, and the devil would share with me, you know, verses out of the Old Testament like, Steve, your, your heart is desperately wicked. And, you know, uh, yeah, who can know it? And there's a, there's a way that seems right unto a man. But, 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 the end, but the end of that way is death. And, you know, and I, I, I'm meditating on those. And then I get myself in this. Yeah, yeah, I, I don't know if this is right, Wendy. I, I, I. And Wendy's much more simple about it. Hey, we did the best job we knew how. We believe God said this. If God wants to... Tell us something else. He he can do it. Let's do it, Steve. (laughs) Steve, will you just decide? (laughs) Whew. Now, a couple verses to start off. My book's called Fully Convinced, The Art of Decision Making. And it really talks about a lot about attaching faith. I use that language a lot, attaching faith to who we are and what we do. And, and by the way, um, Kenneth Copeland, I remember when I was pastoring in, in Nevada in the 90s, and I had about 10 families in my church, and three of them were word of faith. Word of faith, Kenneth Copeland, Kenneth Hagan. And all I knew, all I had heard up to that point was uh, word of faith people were bad. That's all I had heard. And so I thought, well, how many of you know it's easy to criticize people if you don't hear their story? <laughs> I've had pastoring people where I, I, I was kind of frustrated with them, you know, about some things, but then I heard their story. 
And when you hear somebody's story, and when you're willing to ask questions, and when you're willing to pursue rather than just judge from the grandstands, it's going to do a lot. It's going to get rid of a lot of our criticism. But I was still a young leader, and, and so I thought, well, these word of faith people, they're bad. So um, uh, before I rebuke them and, and straighten them out, <laughs> I think I'll read up a little bit, you know, and get some ammunition. Ha <laughs> ha. How many ever heard of Jehovah Sneaky? I started reading, I, and... These word of faith people, but this was, you remember that ancient form of communication called cassette tapes? I mean, these people had boxes of cassette tapes by Kenneth Copeland. Boxes of them. And they, they would bring me over boxes. Hey, uh, Pastor, I think you'll, you need to listen to this. <laughs> I said, well, okay, I'll start listening. Mm-hmm. Man, started, Wendy and I started listening, and something happened to us. We said, these guys actually believe the word. They actually believe the word. And I mean, the, the twin towers of the faith movement are, are God wants you well, and he, and he wants you to walk in abundance. Now, people have mis, misapplied that. People have gone off on extremes. But how many of you know you can't throw the baby out with the bathwater? I mean, every great truth in its beginning it release is going to be messy. It's going to have extremes, and it's going to take those who are discerning and not just reactive to air, but say, okay, God, I don't like that about it. I don't like this. I don't like that. But what are you saying? What are you saying? And God was saying something through that, and he's still saying something through that. And we got rocked, Wendy and I. And I like to say our ministry, Igniting Hope, is a combination of the word of faith, Bill Johnson, and Toronto. We got, we went up to Toronto blessing, and and I'll tell you, you know, something happened in our lives, in our leadership, and the way we think, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm so thankful. And, and, and just the, the, the belief piece in, in, in believing right and getting our doctrine right, getting our declaration, our confession in line with what God's saying rather than with, with what our experience is saying is, is so incredible. And so these verses, let me just, uh, in Romans 4.20, it says this, talking about Abraham, but he, he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God. Just say, I'm giving glory to God. We, 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 we grow in our faith. He grew strong. We grow in our faith by focusing on him and not ourselves, focusing on his goodness. And fully convinced, this is Romans 4, 21, say fully convinced, fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. And so Abraham, who's Abraham, who be, Abram became Abraham, he was on a journey to be fully convinced. And he became fully convinced about who God said he was and what he promised him. And one of the, when we're sanctified, sanctification is becoming conformed into the image of Christ. One of the things that is going to happen to us in sanctification is we're going to be, become fully convinced. Being conformed in the image of Christ isn't just behavioral, it's in our beliefs and thinking. Our thinking is going to go higher. Just say, my thinking's going higher. higher. And then it says in Romans 14, 5, it says, one person esteems one day above another, another esteems every day alike, let each be fully convinced in his own mind. Say fully convinced. Let each be fully convinced in his own mind. 
It's talking about, basically talking about Sabbath. By the way, Romans 14 is such a powerful, powerful chapter. I mean, it's a, somebody in the room is going to memorize Romans 14. It's going to bring breakthrough. I mean, verse 23 of Romans 14 says, whatever is not a faith is sin. Whatever is not a faith, the word sin is an archery term, means missing the mark. Whatever is not a faith will miss the mark in our lives. But we go back to verse 5. It says to be fully convinced. One person esteems one day above another. Another esteems every day alike. You know, Sabbaths, you think, well, it's this day. Or some says, oh, I, Sabbaths every day. He says, ah, be fully convinced in your own mind. So two people could have a different opinion on something like that that's not clearly outlined in Scripture and both be right. Mm-hmm. Someone just go, hmm, 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 <laughs> but, but doubt is... Doubt and double-mindedness is a crippler of great influencers. Wherever we're in doubt or double-mindedness, we're open season to the enemy. Whether it's a decision we've made, whether it's a doctrine we have, where that, that brings an instability within our lives. Now, I want to just, I'm going to give you uh, a few traits of great decision makers. And then I want to get into this whole, we'll close with just being fully convinced. All right, here's some traits. I'll give you, I'm going to give you at least six, maybe more. Here we go. Uh, great decision makers, number one, they are born again and honor the Bible. <laughs> you know, I don't need to say a lot about that. But I've never made a decision uh, in line with Scripture and said, wow, I wish I wouldn't have done that. <laughs> Number two, great decision makers believe they are great decision makers. Just say, I am a great decision maker. <laughs> now, I like to laugh at lies because laughter is a powerful spiritual weapon that breaks off the absurdity of getting our beliefs from the past. It's a, it's a weapon that, that disempowers lies, creating our, our negative strongholds. So I want you to laugh at this lie right here. Okay, you guys ready? And I wanted you to give a hearty laugh on this one. You should not believe you are a great decision maker until you see evidence in your life of great decision making. <laughs> <laughs> now we can't consistently do what we don't believe we are. We cannot consistently do what we don't believe we are. This whole faith thing is not so much about getting things, you know. Yeah, amen, I'm, I'm confessing a, two Cadillacs. Well, okay. We, we bless you that. Maybe God told you to do that. But most of the greatest uh, declarations and confessions is about our own identity. That's, that's where the strongest ones are because that breaks the strongholds. That breaks the self-limiting beliefs that we have that's blocking what God wants to do in our lives. Just say, I am a great decision maker. Because the nature of faith is that you believe and then see. I mean, it sounds so simple, but I missed it. I only believed after I saw. <laughs> Number three is they know when not to make a decision. Great decision makers know when not to make a decision. I know. Um, um, when you're angry and bitter, it's not a good time. If you're not feeling well, it's not a good time. Ha, ha, ha. I mean, 
you, if, you're, if you're just running from things, it's not a good time. I just release over you grace to know when it's just not a good time to make decisions. <laughs> you turn to your neighbor and say, that's, that's a good word for you. <laughs> Number four. Number four, they have, a, they have vision and purpose for their lives. Great decision makers have vision and purpose for their lives. Proverbs 29, 18 says, without a prophetic vision, my people cast off restraint. And, and, and vision and purpose takes our decision making higher. We're just trying to play defense all the time and, and just prevent bad things from happening rather than moving towards something and making a difference in the world, our decision-making will not be at a high level. Number five, they have good people influencing them. Great decision-makers have good people influencing them. It says in, in Proverbs thirteen twenty. Uh, Walk with the wise and become wise, for a companion of fools suffers harm. Who we hang out with, who we allow to influence us, what we feed on is going to greatly determine the level of decision-making that we'll have. That's why I love this culture at Bethel. I, I love it because, man, I, I hear a message like this morning, you hang out with eagles, you become an eagle. I mean, there, there are some negatives. You're hanging out with a lot of eagles. It shines a light on your non-eaglehood. <laughs> I mean, my non-eaglehood in so many areas. Man, I got, there's so many eagles around here. I mean, you got eagle evangelists. You got, you know, you got eagle healers. You got eagle, you know, prophetic people. You got eagle finance people. And again, that that can create doubt in who I am. That can create doubt, and I don't even know that it's, it's a negative in my life rather than a positive. And I just break off uh, using negative comparison to create any identity beliefs about you. Number six is they clarify their options and believe wisdom is coming. I'll talk more about that. They, they clarify their options and believe wisdom is coming. Number seven is they have a God story for what they conclude to do. They have a God story for what they conclude. The greater the risk we take in life is the greater the God story we need. And then number eight is they attach faith to their decisions. They attach faith to their decisions. And, and when you attach faith to your decisions, something powerful happens. And so in the book, uh, this book, Fully Convinced, I have eight chapters, and we have a course that goes along with it that uh, I'll mention at the end. But the chapters... The first chapter is the epidemic of doubt, insecurity, guilt that, that many Christians face, just of being, feeling guilty. Uh, I'm not doing enough. Uh, I, I'm not enough. I'm, I, I'm not giving enough. I'm not serving enough. I, I don't uh, pray enough. I don't read the Bible enough. And, and Steve, will you just decide... Will you decide what you're going to do? You're powerful. And, and yet I've lived so much of my life. I drive by the guy who has a sign, wants money, and, and I won't give, and I'll, I'll, I'll drive by in guilt. And he says, the Lord just says, I, I'm, that thing, you can't take that thing with you where you're going. You can't. And so that's the, 
the first chapter, the second chapter is the power of beliefs. Some of my best content on beliefs. And, and beliefs are powerful. <laughs> Woo! I mean, Jesus, according to your faith, so be it. Woo! The guy in Mark 9, father's son throwing himself into the fire and water, says, Jesus, if you can do something, and Jesus, if I can do something, all, uh, Jesus, all things are possible. Say all things. All things. all things are possible to him who believes. And then the man says, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. I, I get it, but man, can you please help? I need help. I know the problem's not your willingness. The problem is what can I believe for? And, and, and that's, that's my attitude. Whoo! Thank you. And he's the author and finisher of my faith. He's the author and finisher of my beliefs. So I get excited how he's going to finish it. And then chapter three, the fully convinced in key areas of our lives. Chapter four, the art of decision making. Uh, chapter five, attaching great faith to everything we do. Six, empowered towards great decisions. Seven, limitless living. And, and chapter eight is breaking out of the pack. Just say, I'm breaking out of the pack. And what I love about the Lord is he's an equal opportunity God. <laughs> he, he hasn't predestined any of us for mediocrity. Yeah, he hasn't predestined any of us in our future. Well, you know, we're just going to give Steve just a mediocre future. <laughs> Nobody's past can stop them, but current beliefs can The past in itself doesn't have the power to stop anything. But the conclusions that I make based on the past do. All right, let's get, in, let's get into this decision-making. And, and just really, um, we look at the areas that we need to say. Obviously, there's big decisions, and some of you right now are making big decisions. You're, 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 and, and, and the Lord has you listening to this message because he loves you. And it's just going to equip you even, even more. But we're all making decisions. I got family situations where uh, I've just gone back and forth. You know, yeah, I, I, I don't know what I should do. I feel a regret for things. And, it's, and God just said, okay, I need you to decide how you're going to believe. The first question is what you're going to believe about this and then what you're going to do about it. And it has to be in that order. We, some of you have got financial, really big challenges financially. Maybe debt, maybe bad decision, maybe, maybe whatever. You lost your job. Okay, but what are you going to believe about it, number one? And you got all kinds of options. Well, I can believe I'm a victim. Mm -hmm. I mean, when you put it out there, what we can decide to believe, it becomes powerful. I, I, I just didn't do that. I just had this running emotion thing out, but I, I never clarified, yeah, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm deciding I'm going to do this. Um, some of us have, you know, frustration maybe with a boss or coworkers. Let's just laugh at that, by the way. <laughs> hey, just decide. Just decide. Now, here's how I make decisions. I, I clarify my options. All right? I, I look at a situation, and I say, all right, I can do option A, option B, option C, whatever it is. You know, maybe it's moving somewhere. Maybe it's uh, how you, you have a difficult relationship, and you can say, okay, here's one option of how I can handle it. Here's another option of how I can handle it, another one. And then you put under each option, the logical reasons why that is a good, good option or not a good option. Then you put in there any God stories or any wisdom, wisdom in a multitude of counselors, leaders, you got the good people in your life, means you actually have people speaking into your life. And what are they saying? All right. And then you ask God for wisdom. And when you ask God for wisdom, he gets excited. 
James 1, 5 says, if any man lacks wisdom, if any man doesn't know what to do, any man needs ideas, let him ask of God who gives generously and without finding fault. He's not saying, man, how, you're, how come you're asking me? You're bothering me. But listen, that's what it says in verse, but listen what it says in verse six. But let him ask in faith. Whoo, say in faith. in faith. I used to not like that verse. But let him ask in faith with no doubting. Man. Don't doubt wisdom's coming. Just say wisdom's coming. I'm so excited that the Lord's going to tell me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Good job there. Kind of messed that one up. But let him ask in faith with no doubting. For he who doubts is like a wave of a sea tossed to and fro by every wind, every emotion, every new set of circumstances. Oh, yeah, okay, now, boom, I got, okay, now I'm believing that. I thought I was getting better, but I thought, guys, that was a good direction, but now something bad's happened, I'm not sure. <laughs> For he who doubts, it says, I can wait to see, it says, and then it says, it says these encouraging words, and let not that man suppose he will receive anything from the Lord. <laughs> For he is a double minded man, unstable in all his ways. Thanks, Lord. <laughs> Thanks for that encouragement, because that's me. Because I don't believe I'm going to know. And, and he said, I want you to go after that thing. I want you to go after that belief system that says that you... But let, let's just... Let's just laugh at a few more lies. Um, you are spiritually deaf. <laughs> Other people hear God uh, more easily than you. Ha ha ha. Ha, ha, ha. <laughs> yep, let's give an extra laugh on that one. <laughs> it's coming. Wisdom's coming. Wow, I can't wait. I can't wait. Can't wait what the Lord's going to tell me. Can't, can't wait to, how, uh, you know, uh, uh, what he's going to say. It's like when I order a package uh, and I get a tracking number. As soon as I see the tracking number, I release my faith over the tracking number. Anybody else do that? Yeah, amen. I, I, I believe. I believe. It's coming. It's coming. I see it. I believe. That's what the Lord's doing with us right now. We got a James 1, 5 tracking number. He says he's going to give wisdom liberally, generously. It's coming. Man, I'm going to know. Man. I'm going to know what to do about that financial thing. I don't like it. But I'm going to know what to do. And then you ask God for wisdom, and then you go open for God stories, and you put God stories in there, prophetic words, dreams, come to church, you hear things, you just, wow. And then, and then you, 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 get a, you get a decision. And most decision-making is concluding. Say concluding. It's concluding. Most decision-making is you, you look at the options, you look at what God's saying, and then you conclude. I believe the Lord's saying this. I believe he's saying this. And then you attach faith. If it's a big decision, I do things like this, and I say, Lord, uh, I, I'm, I am deciding to do this. Father, I want, I want to let you know. 
Hmm? I'm concluding this is how you're leading. And if it's a big decision, I'll say I'll give you one week to change my mind. And you can't change my mind through negative circumstances or negative emotions. You can only change my mind through another God story. And then I attach faith. I say, I believe God wants me to do this. Mm -hmm. I believe, I believe, wants me to do this. And then you say, well, can you change your mind down? Yeah, he can. I, I, I tell you, you can change my mind. But I'm not just jumping back and forth with what I'm believing and what I'm doing just every week. You know, I got a new thing. I'm saying, hey, listen, Lord, you, you can do it. But you're, uh, if I begin to doubt again, I'm going to re-clarify my options. I'm going to go through the whole process again. And then I'm going to conclude. Now, here's the last verse I want to give you. And I've shared this. Some of you have heard this lately, but it's been really impacting me. In 2 Corinthians 9, it says, it's the great giving chapter, and it says, but each one must give as he has decided in his heart. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart not reluctantly or under compulsion. For God loves a cheerful giver. That's one of the most empowering verses in the whole Bible. Man, what? You trust me to decide in my heart? That's a sign you're moving from a slave to a son. It's a sign that you're actually growing up. I don't, I don't expect my adult children to phone me. Uh, Dad, uh, I need, I'm, I'm looking in my closet today. And will you please give me a command of what shirt I'm to wear? Let's laugh at that. <laughs> hey, you're powerful. You decide. And the, the more we grow is the more we'll decide, the more God will trust you. You say, well, man, that sounds kind of scary. Well, the greatest truths in the Bible have the greatest potential for abuse. But we don't, we don't run from those truths just because somebody might abuse them. So it says each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. The principle there is that God loves a cheerful decider. That's the principle. Cheerfulness is one of the main evidences we've attached faith to what we're doing and who we are. And because... We decide how much we're going to give in energy for something, how much passion, how, what we're going to give in causes. And there's really, there, there's different ways we can do things. We can do things out of duty and obligation. Somebody say boo. boo. That's doing things reluctantly and compulsion. It, what that means is, I don't want to, but I have to. Some people do their marriages that way. Some people do their jobs that way. Some people do their finances that way. I'm trapped. I'm trapped. Yeah, I'm trapped. I, 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 I'm stuck. No, I say, hey, Steve, will you just decide? Will you go through the process and decide? You're powerful. The Bible calls it when we do things out of duty, a dead work. A dead work. A dead work is anything that we haven't attached faith to. <laughs> Little delayed reaction in that section over there. I, I don't know. If maybe, maybe it takes a while for the sound to get over there. <laughs> 
It's interesting, Hebrews 6, 1, uh, 6, 1, 2, and 3 talks about the elementary principles of the kingdom, and the first, there's six of them. The first one is repentance from dead works. Faith towards God, doctrine of baptisms, laying on of hands, resurrection of the dead, eternal judgment. But the first one's repentance from dead works. By the way, tonight is a repentance from dead works meeting. So that's one way I can do it. I don't want to do it, but I have to do it. <laughs> Second way is we can just do it in doubt. I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm not sure I should be here. I'm not sure I should be in the school. I'm not sure I should be at this job. I'm not sure I should buy this thing. I'm not sure I should be under this leader. Not sure I should be at Bethel. <laughs> in doubt. Wherever we're in doubt, it's open season for us. It's hunting season. Or, or my, when I'm in doubt, my picture's on the tree. Hunting season for Steve. Because <laughs> the devil, the devil's just, I'm just, I'll be moved to and fro by emotions and circumstances. I'll have no stability in me. The third way we can do things is through passivity. I'm just showing up. Hope it's a good meeting. <laughs> Going home tonight. Hope things are good at the house. Hope Buddy's behavior is better. <laughs> We're waiting to see what happens. I hope 2023 is a good year. I hope. No. When you attach faith, 2023 is going to be the best year of my life. And in the last way we, we, <clears throat> we can do something is by attaching faith. We do it in faith. And that's really the, the essence of being fully convinced. The art of decision-making is that we've decided. As a young leader, I said, I can't wait until I do something great for you. And the Lord said, Steve, instead of waiting to do something great for me, why don't you attach great faith to what you're doing now, and it will become great. I'm not waiting. I had to learn this stuff out in the desert when I was hardly influencing anybody. And I said, I'm, I'm a great leader. I'm, we're leading a great work out here. We're changing the world. I'm going to impact nations. I'm a nation impactor. And I started attaching faith to some things that were ridiculous. And that's, that's the fourth way. And anytime we attach faith to what we're doing, to our assignments, to our callings, to our responsibilities. When I attach faith, I get energy, cheerfulness, and power. I get energy. Someone say energy. energy. I get cheerfulness. Say cheerfulness. cheerfulness. And I get power. power. And I'll say it again. A lot of people's tiredness is because they're not attaching faith to what they're doing. They're doing things out of doubt or double-mindedness or out of duty and obligation. And I, I have a message for you tonight. That thing's going. And I, you know what I'm hearing in my spirit tonight? <laughs> I, I'm hearing that nobody is here by accident. Nobody's listening to this message by accident. Nobody's on YouTube tonight by accident. Because decision-making is one of the most important aspects of our spiritual journey. It's one of the most important aspects of our spiritual journey is decision-making and coming to the place of being fully convinced. And I'm not fully convinced about everything. I'm still, there's some areas I'm doubting, some areas where I'll go back and forth, but they're becoming a lot less. They're becoming a lot less because I'm, I am a person who, I, you know, how many of you know we don't want to waste time here on earth? 
I, I want to do this and just before we close. If you are in a major, if you're, make, if you're right now, you're just in a place where you're making a big decision in your life. Just stand up right now. Where you're just in a, space, a, a big transition. <laughs> yeah. All right. Wow. Big decisions. I've got a word for you. You're going to know what to do. I've got a word. Yep. Mm-hmm. And, and, and I, I break off anxiety concerning that. I release just right now a gift of faith over you. And I release to you an impartation of an upgrade in your beliefs that you'll know what to do and be empowered by God to do it. It's not just knowing what to do. He provides the grace to do it. And I'll say this. Like I tell my dog. Just be patient with me out there. I say, <laughs> as I see him out there just struggling, indecision and doubt. I see it. And, and, and I just say, buddy, will you just decide? But I want to say this. I'm not going to be, I'm not going to say exactly those words, but I'm going to say over you that you are going to decide, and you are in a season of breaking out of doubt, double-mindedness, indecision, uh, and and, uh, just going back and forth, or not even clarifying that you are in a place of needing to make a decision and what to believe and then what to do. I, I just speak over you that grace is being released to you right now. Just say right now. Grace is being released over you right now for breakthrough in that decision that you are are, are standing for right now. But most importantly, that God is putting a peace in you that he's going to do it. And you are going to see and you're going to conclude and you're going to attach faith and it's going to bring breakthrough first in you and then it's going to bring breakthrough in the circumstances. If you believe that, say amen. Amen. Just give the Lord a shout of praise. Yes. Just come on up, baby. Hey. Yeah, hey, you guys received that whole word? All right, so I got, Ben, I just, I'm going to do a couple things, but I love having you. Oh, I love being next to you, ben, Steve. you know, you're just. Uh, I'm fully convinced that you're fully the right convinced. place to be. I know. You know, I'm fully convinced. You know, I remember when I was first a young preacher, I was trying to decide, you know, I don't know if I should preach this or that. And the Lord says, just decide. <laughs> I'm fully, I'm glad you're fully convinced to be here. By the way, I want to give you a copy of that book. Thank you. Just I need that. I receive that. And, and we also have um, uh, just in the, I'm going to be signing books for those of you who uh, would want to purchase one tonight. If you can't afford the book, do what you can. Let our team know. Uh, and it's also available on Amazon. Bethel Bookstore has some as well if you don't want to, you know, wait tonight. And then, you know what else, Ben, we're doing? What are we doing, Steve? Well, I want to slide up for a, a marriage conference. Wow. And Wendy and I are doing an online marriage conference coming up. That would be wisdom. Yeah. And we... Um, we have a team, uh, Peter and Melinda, who are helping out on the book table. They're going to be speaking. But we're doing a, um, it's going to be released on February 10th and 11th, right before Valentine's Day. And we're doing a two-day uh, of content that we have that can be accessed those two days or for a year afterwards for people who want to just go to the next level and have their marriage ignited about beliefs and breakthrough or you, you're thinking of getting married or whatever. And so that's, that's coming up. And, and Ben, I think that's it. 
How many of you love and appreciate Steve Backland? We love you so much, Steve. We're so thankful for you. 